Thank you for the invitation to give this keynote presentation today. My name is Mike Francis, and what I would like to do is to talk about the veterinary vaccine development process, how it can potentially be accelerated, and why platform technologies are so important to the production of new generation vaccines. So what do we need to consider when we're developing a new vaccine? Well, first and foremost, we need to identify the unmet market needs for this new vaccine, and we need to develop an outline product concept. And in doing so, doing so we should involve cross-discipline input from research and development, from marketing, from manufacturing, and from finance. We need to produce a clear target product profile and associated timelines for the product development. And the product should be designed with the end user in mind, so it's essential that we have customer input throughout. So let's consider the vaccine development process. This can be split up into different stages, and it's split between the research and development phases. Within the research phase, you have discovery and feasibility, and this can take five years or more to complete. Within the development phase, you have an early phase development, a late phase development, and a registration phase, and typically this takes three to six years to complete. Looking at it in more detail, the veterinary vaccine discovery phase involves developing an understanding of the pathogen and the immune response within the intended target species. This in turn will help in the development of a suitable challenge model designed to mimic the natural infection, and this can be used to assess the protective efficacy of an experimental vaccine. Once an appropriate immunogenic formulation has been identified, then a project can move into the feasibility phase. This involves proof of concept, safety and efficacy studies within the target species for the vaccine. It's important to ensure that the immune response elicited by the vaccine correlates with protection within the host, and thus optimum immunization strategies can be developed. It will hopefully result in the identification of a lead vaccine formulation. As soon as there is confidence that the experimental veterinary vaccine candidate elicits an immune response that provides suitable protection then this formulation can be moved into early phase development. It is necessary at this stage to prepare and safely store a pre-master seed and a master seed of the lead antigen. The early phase development is focused on addressing three key elements within a regulatory dossier, which within the UK and the European Union are broadly defined as quality or the manufacture, safety and efficacy. The quality data package should address purity and consistent consistency of the final manufactured product and ensure that each batch of vaccine is fit for purpose. The safety testing will be dependent on the nature of the vaccine, for example, whether it's inactivated, live attenuated or recombinant. This will generally include single, repeat and possibly overdose studies carried out with maximum potency product in minimum age animals. Further studies will also be required for animals in pregnancy or birds in lay. Finally, the efficacy data should include onset and duration of immunity studies conducted with minimum potency product in minimum aged animals. It may also involve efficacy in the face of maternally derived antibodies, a study of the requirements for a booster dose, and an investigation into the immune mechanisms involved in the host's response to the vaccine. During the early phase development, the pilot scale manufacturing process should be validated and scaled up to levels more reflective of the final manufacturing scale. This should eventually result in three GMP manufactured consistency batches and finished filled product that can be used in stability tests and field trials. Data from early phase development is used to apply for permission to conduct field trials as part of late phase development to ensure that the vaccine is both safe and efficacious 
under field conditions, which are designed to mimic its everyday use. The details of the trials will depend on the species for which the vaccine is being developed. The registration phase will be dependent on the regulatory strategy and the intended markets for the product. It's important to consider the recommended dose and route of administration for each species and category of animal in which the vaccine is intended for use. These maps have principally focused on the development of a vaccine for the UK and EU and will lead to the generation of a product data package that would be used to compile a regulatory dossier for marketing approval. Other global markets will have their own regulatory agencies and specific regulatory requirements. The maps can be found on www.vaccinedevelopment.org.uk and details of the process have been published recently in the journal Vaccine. Now, what can we do to accelerate the vaccine development? Well, in the research and development phase, we should be using an experienced project manager and develop a comprehensive plan so that we can identify the critical path for the product and look at ways in which we can shorten that path. We should conduct early proof of concept studies wherever possible in target species, and we should establish early correlates of protective immunity. We should use pilot scale vaccine produced according to the final manufacturing process in all the critical trials so that they can be used in a regulatory submission. And wherever possible, we should run early safety and efficacy trials in parallel. Regarding accelerating the manufacturing process, wherever possible, we should utilize existing technologies so that we're not having to develop and validate something entirely new. And we must ensure that we record all reagents being used in the process. We should prepare a master seed prior to any animal trials so that the data can be used for regulatory submission. And we should define the outline manufacturing process at an earlier stage as possible. We should establish the potency test early on so that we can begin stability studies as soon as possible, because these can often be rate limiting. And we should scale up the process in parallel with safety and efficacy studies running. And this means that we do this at risk. Regarding accelerating the regulatory phase, it's very important that you talk to the regulatory authorities at as an earlier stage as possible. There are various opportunities to do this in Europe. There's an innovation task force briefing where you can discuss a new concept for a vaccine. There are scientific advice meetings and there's a pre-submission meeting. We should generate sufficient target species safety data and provisional efficacy data as soon as possible so that you can apply for field trial approval. And we should consider using minor use, minor species regulations within the EU. To use an established and well characterized vaccine platform will also help the process because regulators will understand the technology. And there is a new regulation, VMP Reg EU 2019-6, that's coming into force in January 2022. And the aim of this is to support, support vaccine innovation and platform technologies in the future. So moving on to different novel platform technology for vaccines, well, of course, vaccines are like broadly split into two areas, inactivated killed products and attenuated live products. New technologies for inactivated products would include subunit proteins and virus-like particles. Whereas for live products, we have viral vector technologies and nucleic acid technologies be it messenger RNA, self-amplifying RNA, or DNA technology. What I'd like to do now is to give you an example of a One Health approach to Rift Valley fever vaccination using a novel platform technology. And this is work led by George Wimwe, who's a principal investigator at the Jenner Institute in Oxford, and it's in collaboration with the Purbright Institute in Surrey. Rift Valley fever is a bunya virus and it's a mosquito-borne virus. It causes a zoonotic disease in livestock, in sheep, in goats, in cattle and in camels, and also disease in humans. 
It occurs in Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. It causes a febrile illness progressing to a meningoencephalitis, retinitis, fulminant hepatitis, blindness and hemorrhagic syndrome and it causes 20 to 50 percent mortality. It's a World Health Organization notifiable disease and there's currently no licensed human vaccine. There is a veterinary vaccine however and this is an attenuated Smithburn vaccine but this has problems with its safety within pregnant animals. So the concept here was to use a vector and the vector chosen here was a chimpanzee adenovirus vector called CHADOX1. And this particular vector is a non-replicating vector and it's non-replicating due to deletions of the E1 and E3 genes. The vaccine antigens are actually encoded within the viral genome and they do not appear as a structural part of the virion. The genes inserted from Rift Valley fever were the GN and GC genes which are responsible for immunity to the virus. This particular vector has been used for a number of other human vaccines and it, including COVID-19 where it's one of the lead candidate vaccines for human vaccination. So the concept was to produce one vaccine for multiple species, for goats, sheep, cattle and camels and humans. When the CHADOX1 vector is injected into the body, it enters the cells and starts to express the antigens from Rift Valley fever. These antigens can be detected by macrophages and presented to B cells to produce an antibody response to the proteins. And they can also be degraded and processed and be presented in the context of class one molecules on the surface of the cells presented to CD8 positive T cells to elicit a cytotoxic T cell response. So the vector has the properties of eliciting both an antibody and a cell mediated immune response. If we just look at some of the antibody data that have been generated in cattle, sheep and goats, and this is data generated at 28 days after a single vaccination, and we're looking at virus neutralization teeters against Rift Valley fever. What we see here is that the CHADOX1 vector, the CHADOX1 vector plus an adjuvant matrix Q and the Smith-Byrne vaccine, the control vaccine, all elicit good antibody responses in all three species. And these are very equivalent responses and there's actually little advantage in adding an adjuvant to the vector. The placebo group, of course, show no response to any in any of the species. If we then go on to look at viremia post challenge in vaccinated pregnant animals, we can see that both in sheep and goats, the vaccine provides complete protection against viremia and within mock vaccinated animals, the viremia is quite significant and peaks at around three days post challenge. These particular animals, there was also a prevention of any abortion with the animals and the vaccine was shown to be entirely safe within the pregnant animals, having no effect on the pregnancy within the animals themselves. Another important aspect of a vaccine is its stability. And this is some work done more recently with a pump priming grant from the International Veterinary Vaccinology Network. And based upon in vitro vaccine potency data, a liquid formulation of the CHADOX1 Rift Valley fever vaccine is stable for one week at 30 degrees centigrade and for at least a month at 20 degrees centigrade. Additional in vivo data shows that there was no loss of immunogenicity of the liquid formulated vaccine after the month at 20 degrees centigrade. Furthermore, if we go on to lyophilize or freeze dry the vaccine in a stabilizing formulation, it's stable for at least six months at 30 degrees centigrade. So we have identified two options here for distribution of the CHADOX1 vaccine at 20 degrees and 30 degrees centigrade outside of the normal cold chain. So what are the overall benefits of a vectored CHADOX1 Rift Valley fever vaccine? Well, it's a single shot vaccine and it can be used in multiple species. That is to say in goats, in sheep, in cattle and in camels. It provides a good antibody response and it provides protective immunity within the animals. 
It also prevents viremia, which should restrict the spread of the virus, and it prevents abortion within pregnant animals. It's also shown to be entirely safe within pregnant animals, and there are currently large-scale field trials ongoing in Africa to test its suitability under field conditions. The vaccine also displays good stability even under some elevated temperatures. And what is interesting here is that the same master seed is also being used for the human vaccine. In fact, the manufacturing processes are very similar up to the bulk harvest stage, at which stage the human vaccine undergoes a little bit more purification, but pretty, the vaccines are pretty much identical. So it's a true One Health approach to vaccination. It's interesting to note that novel vaccine technologies often find their first application within veterinary vaccines. For example, recombinant technologies such as subunits, virus-like particles, vectors and DNA vaccines have all been licensed for use within veterinary medicine. Veterinary vaccines often use novel adjuvants, innovative delivery systems and novel stabilization techniques. Indeed, there are veterinary regulatory guidelines to facilitate new technologies, including those for live recombinant vector vaccines and for DNA vaccines. Having said this, it's worth noting that the majority of new vaccines are still based on conventional, inactivated and attenuated approaches. So let's consider some of the firsts for biotechnology that have occurred within animal health. As far back as 1965, production of foot and mouth disease vaccine using BHK suspension cells was really the forerunner for a lot of biotechnology processes that were to follow. In 1982, the first recombinant vaccine was licensed against E. coli in pigs. And in 1988, a recombinant subunit vaccine was produced against a retroviral disease in cats, feline leukemia. Throughout the 1990s, a range of canary pox vectored vaccines were licensed for example, against rabies, feline leukemia, and equine influenza. And in 2005, the first ever DNA vaccine was licensed against a viral disease in salmon. In the same year, a plant-produced vaccine was licensed against Newcastle disease in poultry. More recently, in 2017, a three-component viral vector vaccine was licensed against Newcastle disease, infectious bursal disease, and Marek's disease in poultry. So what are the key messages on veterinary vaccine development that we need to take away from today's talk? Well, firstly, it's important to generate a clear target product profile, sometimes called an SPC or summary of product characteristics for the new vaccine. And this should consider all the market requirements for that vaccine. Commercial input is required throughout the vaccine's development and an early interaction with regulators is important to facilitate the regulatory process and smooth the pathway to licensure of the final vaccine. We should always investigate various options to accelerate the development process wherever we can and we need to be adaptable and quick to respond to any changes throughout the vaccine development. It's interesting to note that significant innovation already exists within a number of commercialized veterinary vaccines. And I feel that the use of novel platform technologies will be important for the rapid development of new vaccines against emerging diseases in the future. Thank you for your attention.